You are listening to the second episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. We're back from our journey west, and regularly scheduled podcasting has resumed. So this week we're trying out a second episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff for you to listen to and tell us what you think. The idea behind this new podcast is to do what almost no other political or media podcast does, but which movie, TV, and literature podcasts do all the time. Look back on that which came before and give it context. No other field of serious cultural inquiry insists that each day everything that happened prior to that day must be tossed out and that only what happens today matters. Yet there is no subject more aggressively avoided by the very serious men and women who dominate media and politics than the past. Specifically, the Republican Party's past. How it came to be that the racist shit pile it is now, and you can tell Drift Glass wrote this, and how the media enabled it by coddling the GOP when it was in power and memory holding its atrocities when it was out of power. Today, we're going to tell you a story about one of the most dangerous men in American politics. Yes, yes. And drum roll, please. That man's name is David Brooks. And he has worked for the New York Times as its senior conservative columnist for 19 years since September of 2003. Now, here's a fun fact. David Brooks's fellow Iraq war pimp and his boss at the Weekly Standard, Bill Kristol, was also hired by the New York Times a few years later as the Times scrambled to do then what MSNBC is scrambling to do now, bring on high-profile conservative faces to try to increase the size of their audience. Now, Kristol was sacked by the Times a year later, presumably for being a dull, lazy, error-prone writer that he has always been. Time magazine almost immediately hired him, and then they let him go a year later, after which he was hired by Fox, and then let go by Fox. Then a barely pubescent lad named Jonathan Greenberger, who was suddenly made executive producer of ABC's Sunday show this week, his very first hire was Bill Kristol, who Mr. Greenberger described as an, quote, original thinker with a unique perspective on the political and cultural landscape. And for decades, that has been the pattern among a select group of Beltway pundits who apparently can never be allowed to remain unemployed or out of the spotlight for long, no matter how objectively awful they are at their job. And you used Bill Crystal as an example because he went through so many revolving doors. Yeah. But... Many more than David Brooks, but David Brooks just continues to write bad columns Yes, every week and then spin those into TV shows. And you told me you were having problems prepping for this episode uh, and that it was kind of weird and challenging because there's actually too much material in your specific archives. Yeah, that that is true. I, I cop to that. It's way too much David Brooks material at the old Drift Glass podcast or Drift Glass blog, because as anyone who has listened to our Professional Left podcast or read my blog for any length of time knows, uh, I've been writing about David Brooks for a very long time. Uh, in fact, I started blogging on May 31st, 2005. My very first David Brooks post went up on April 9th of 2005. And of the 10,500 posts I've written since then, and I checked, the more than 500 posts that I just abandoned in my draft folder for later and never got back around to, I'm really confident that at least a couple thousand of them were about or made mention of Mr. David Brooks. Now, I used to break down his New York Times columns a couple of times a week. 
that averages out if you take the highs and lows. Let's say conservatively, I was on that beat for 15 years, 50 weeks out of the year, two columns per week, give or take. That's 1,500 posts, give or take, plus Brooks's ubiquitous appearances on Meet the Press and PBS and so forth. And I got so proficient at it that you and I, Blue Gal, used to play a game. Where yes, I we would did. guess, <laughs> yes, we did, where I would attempt to guess exactly how he would be framing whatever the topic was on this particular day and tell you within a paragraph or two where he would hide the both sides do it razor in the apple because that razor in the apple is always there. And I think you'll admit I got pretty good at it. You uh, did. And you you taught me that. Like, look for the razor in the apple. And it was always both sides do it or Democrats are just as bad or Democrats are awful. And it was uh, always angling towards the holy and sacred center mm-hmm, because it was always mm-hmm. the extremes on both. And it didn't matter what the subject was. It didn't matter what day of the week it was. It didn't matter who was president, really. It was always, always, always the holy center. David Brooks occupied the holy center and the extremes on both sides is why everything was horrible. But honestly, I haven't written at length about Brooks in a while because, frankly, after nearly 18 years of critiquing his public performance nearly every week, including filming him live at a lecture in 2010 where he stood in the pulpit of a church and flatly lied, I questioned the value of adding one more piece of evidence to a pile of evidence that has already crushed the evidence table. Mm-hmm. It, I thought about it. It's like being the protagonist in The Lady Vanishes, which I know you love, or Mm -hmm. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. You figure out what's going on and that what's going on is really, really dangerous and bad, and no one believes you, no matter how calmly or strenuously or repeatedly or loudly you warn them. Instead, you get back, you know, this guy, this prissy, myopic little nebbish who's on PBS every week and NPR, who wrote some book about character, you're telling me that guy is a leading threat to democracy? And my answer is yes. Going all the way back to the filth he published when he worked at the Weekly Standard, David Brooks and his imitators have been every bit as much a threat to our democracy as Rush Limbaugh and his imitators. Okay, so it's possible that some listeners had no idea that David Brooks worked for the Weekly Standard or even what what is the Weekly Standard. Mm-hmm. Um The Weekly Standard was the high-toned journal of snobby conservative hit pieces that Rupert Murdoch set up to pair with all of his garbage-level conservative trash media outlets like the New York Post and Fox News. This was sort of an elite wingnut clubhouse. It was run by Bill Kristol, as you said, who hired Brooks to be his managing editor And while Brooks was there, he cranked out the kind of strident, venomous garbage that would make Rich Lowry or Hugh Hewitt proud. And and just for the record, more than a decade ago, I did a pretty comprehensive overview of the kind of work that Brooks did at the Weekly Standard, which I entitled, What Matters is the Work. And that post runs about 10,000 words. It was generally well-received among my readers, got no play whatsoever and made no material difference out in the wider world, uh, which is something one needs to get used to if one is going to critique any conservatives in the media, but especially David Brooks. So the question for me was where to start an episode about someone who is outwardly bland and dull like David Brooks, a guy who on the one hand comes across as a prissy, myopic, middle-aged, PBS, NPR nebbish, but who is in fact one of the most consequential and dangerous conservative public figures of the last 30 years. And so, as America's preeminent Brooksologist, I decided the best place to start is right in the middle, in medias res, in the middle, back in 2013, before Trump, when David Brooks was fully into the second phase of his career as the undisputed king of both sides do it punditry, I wrote a long, kind of fanciful post, little science fiction-y, Called, yeah, it was, it was, because it postulates the future. And it was called In Search of Historic Bobo, which is what people used to call David Brooks. Uh, and in this, in this fictional future, historians debate which of two leading theories about this thing called David Brooks must be true. 
And half of the scholars in this fictional future period believe that David Brooks, quote unquote, must have been like a pseudonym for an amalgamation of a whole bunch of different but wildly different people. But the other half of the scholars insist that since so much of what he was alleged to have written was so obviously false and absurd, David Brooks had to be like a literary contrivance, something like Edgar Allan Poe's nameless speaker of the telltale heart, you know, a fictional narrator whose own pathological unreliability is integral to the story. But virtually all future scholars agree that this quote-unquote David Brooks thing could not possibly have been a real person, and certainly not a person of great influence who was paid a lot of money to publish his ludicrous little columns in American newspapers of record, because that's just crazy. I mean, have you actually read the ridiculous crap that came out under the byline of this guy decade after decade? This all had to be part of some really elaborate joke that the future historians just don't get. But unfortunately, Brooks is a very real and very influential conservative who continues to be paid an enormous sum of money to publish his ludicrous columns in America's newspaper of record after his public record has clearly established him as a man who routinely and adamantly is wrong about virtually everything. The casual Brooks observer, and you are not a casual Brooks no, observer. No, I'm, I'm a formal <laughs> scholar of the subject. <laughs> may notice that interest in a specific lie that Brooks is telling in a particular column can spike every few months or so if it happens to intersect with a particular topic of interest to them or if some other blue check weighs in. For example, Brooks has repeatedly used his column to deny, obscure, or otherwise deflect questions about the racism at the heart of the Republican Party. He once jogged past a Tea Party rally being held next to a black family picnic in Washington, and the two groups were not at each other's throats, so Brooks concluded that the Tea Party was definitely not racist. He he, he did, and he wrote that. And he, and he said, said it, it on depressed. television. Yes, he it, it did. It was just, wow. Uh, in 2007, after Paul Krugman wrote about Ronald Reagan using very thinly veiled racist dog whistle appeals to racist voters in the South, Brooks lost his mind and penned an entire how dare you impugn the sanctity of St. Ronald Reagan article that never mentioned Paul Krugman once because (laughs) the New York Times has this weird policy of not allowing its op-ed writers to address each other directly. Brooks was immediately schooled by the entire internet and while he backed off, he never changed his mind. So this week, when Brooks wrote a column which not only dragged Dr. Ibram X. Kendi into one of Brooks's sermons about how both sides do racism and then flat out lied about Mr. Kendi's work, there was a spike of immediate and justified indignation across social media. Uh, he also used um, what I, I have to imagine he was just too bland and bored to correct in his writing and he has no editors but he used what was essentially a anti-semitic dog whistle in one of his columns uh and it goes right along with all the anti-semitism we're seeing from the republican party this week oh yeah no he's he's shameless yep uh so but this justified indignation always fades because over the decades brooks has made a cottage industry out of conspicuously refusing to see the racism on the right even as it stared him in the face. And each time there was a spike in outrage over it, he just moves on. After a few days, the world moves on along with him, and David Brooks is none the worse for wear. So uh, this outrage will fade too, leaving David Brooks untouched again. And he will go right on from one god-awful column to another until the day he decides to retire. Because that's how the Beltway media works. No matter how grossly and repeatedly men like Brooks fail at the basic job of journalism, they're never disciplined because their job is not journalism. They mask themselves as journalism. They call themselves journalists, but they're not journalists. Their job is telling reassuring fairy tales that the readers want to hear. And that's why when Brooks cranks out yet another turd of both uh, both siders garbage, Media scholars and Brooks critics see something very different 
than a specific god-awful op-ed on a specific topic. Because after closely studying Brooks's pathological bosiderism over time, the question of what Brooks is getting wrong or lying about during any given column becomes secondary to the question of why he is always lying in pretty much exactly the same way year after year. Why he continues to be so richly rewarded and professionally revered for writing the same bullshit column over and over again, decade after decade. And what the cumulative effect of all those lies has been on our national political discourse. And sadly, the answer to the first question is pretty depressingly tautological. Uh, Brooks lies in pretty much exactly the same way year after year because that's what his employers at the New York Times pay him to do. This particular brand of bullshit he's selling now is what the Schulzberger family wants on the pages of their paper. It's what elite readers of the Times want to hear. Just as the specific brand of bullshit he was selling when he worked for the Weekly Standard was what Bill Crystal and his readership of the Standard wanted to hear. And that makes the arc of Brooks's career pretty easy to understand, especially when you track it over time. When he was at the Weekly Standard, Brooks very, very carefully built his public resume around three foundational subjects. Number one, national greatness. He was a bear <laughs> for national greatness. Number two, the implacable anarcho-communism of us hilariously feckless liberal. We were idiots, and he loved laughing at us. And third, the awesomeness of great men and the conservative elite institutions they command. Very simple to understand. For example, while at the Weekly Standard, Brooks wrote some really genuinely goofy nonsense, like an entire column favorably comparing Gilligan of Gilligan's Island <laughs> to George W. Bush. I wow. swear to you, this is all true. Now, the Weekly Standard is gone. The links are all gone, but I still have them on my blog. And this is what I retrieved from my very own blog. I never really considered the way George W. Bush resembles Gilligan of Gilligan's Island until I read Paul A. Cantor's brilliant book, Gilligan Unbound, Pop Culture in the Age of Globalization, which sounds fictional, but it's really a thing that David Brooks read. As Cantor points out, Gilligan is not the smartest one on the island. He doesn't have the obvious leadership resume, yet the audience instinctively sympathizes with him, and the show's creators were right to put him in the center. In episode after episode, the fate of the Islanders usually rests in the hands and he usually serves them well. Gilligan, as George W. Bush, as an admirable, affable fuck-up who somehow always gets it right in the end. And he wrote a lot of that crap, but he really got his He didn't yacht. write F up, though. He didn't write fuck up. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, that's just me okay. uh, being okay. cruel, using my okay. salty language, which is why I'm not on any, <laughs> any television program right now. Um... But David Brooks really got his yayas out, really enjoyed himself. You can tell when he's hitting his stride, whenever he climbed all the way to the top of the mountain of his own self-righteousness to sneer at us awful, stupid, America-hating liberals. Uh, he railed against us as the, quote, new stupid party. Now I'm reading quotes. Quote, after the past week, it is perhaps time to acknowledge that when it comes to brainless, self-destructive behavior, the Democratic Party has achieved a level of excellence that will be unsurpassed in our lifetime. Now, this is because we liberals have cooked up some, quote, brainless, self-destructive fantasy that George Bush was about to wipe out the Clinton surplus, and run up gargantuan deficits again, and put Social Security under the gun. And for the record, everything we brainless, self-destructive idiots warned that Bush was going to do, Bush actually did. Mm -hmm. And the results were even worse, if you remember, than what we feared. Uh, but one of the perks of being a pundit, like David Brooks, is that you cruise through life never having to worry that anyone will ever hold you accountable for anything you say or do. Which is why you, my dear, yes. coined the famous Beltway Iron Rule of David Brooks. I did. After watching you for many years, mm -hmm. I realized that there was an ironclad rule of David Brooks. And I got that from watching the PBS NewsHour. <laughs> because, and, and also meet the press. Whenever David Brooks is on these talk shows, uh, he was asked about the column that he wrote this week. Yep. 
And they would ask him, the host would ask him, do you agree with what you wrote this week? And he said, why, yes, I do agree with what I wrote this week. Why, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. And he would talk for five minutes about what he wrote this week. It, it's the easiest job in the world. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to come up with anything new beyond 1,600 words a week. <laughs> That's it. And they're the and same 1,600 he's done every two weeks forever. Right. So do you really believe both sides do it? Why, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Because both sides do it. We'll leave and it there. We got to leave, we'll leave it there, David we got to leave it there, right. Yeah. So one, once I realized this, it's like, okay, but you're not asking him about how many times he was wrong about the Iraq war, how many times he was wrong about the American economy, how many times he was wrong about how uh, Bush handled the American economy or the Iraq war. And so I realized the iron, the beltway iron rule of David Brooks is it is mandatory to quote what David Brooks said this week to David Brooks. That's mm -hmm. required if you're going to have him on the show. Ask him about what he wrote. <laughs> it is forbidden to quote what David Brooks said last week or any other time before. Mm -hmm. This is about promoting his column this week only. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of why we did this show, too. Yeah, is and Beltway Iron Rule of David Brooks t-shirts will soon be available in the lobby. <laughs> Um, no, along with won't. the rest of our merch. No, they won't. Because <laughs> nobody will get it except, well, you know, us and our friends here. But it is it does encapsulate how the mainstream media treats history. Right. Which is there is no history. There is no history. We don't have to we don't have to worry about what Reagan did and what Bush did and what uh how all of this led right up to Rush Limbaugh. No. All of the connections. All. Nobody nobody wants to know about that. We only want to talk about what David Brooks wrote this week. And, and that really is why we are doing this new podcast yeah, yeah. entitled no fair remembering stuff because <laughs> it it is literally the worst sin you can commit on cable news or in American op-ed papers or um, on network news on, on, on political shows, remembering the past and, and bringing up what somebody said with earnest conviction just last month, because nine times out of 10, they're going to sound stupid because they are, they're, they're selling an ideology, not, not telling you what's really going on. They're lying to you. And their lies keep falling apart. And it's true of all the dumb fucks. It's true of all the all the lunatics on the right. But it's also true of David Brooks. It's also true of the high-toned, high-end pundits. So back we go to the Weekly Standard, where David Brooks is railing against the Pelosi Democrats. Remember, this is 2001. Okay, this is a while ago. Quote, are they going to become the stupid party? Are the Democrats about to go insane? Are they about to decide that the reason they lost the 2002 election, I'm sorry, it's 2002, is that they didn't say what they really believe? Are they going to go into a Paul Krugman land, lambasting tax cuts and savaging Bush as a corporate, as the tool of corporate bosses? Yes, we're going to do all that. Uh, in January 2001, he was screeching about competent conservatives and reactionary liberals. Quote, we seem to be entering a period of competent conservatism and reactionary liberalism. George W. Bush has put together a cabinet long on management experience and practical skills, but liberal commentators and activists, their imaginations aflame, seem to be caught in a time warp back in the days when Norman Lear still had hair. <laughs> I don't know why he picks these weirdo targets, but he's a weirdo, you know, through and through. This is from February of 2001. What on earth has gotten into the liberals and the media? Perhaps affected by some sort of post-Palm Beach stress disorder, reporters and activists on the left have depicted George W. Bush as the leader of some sort of arch-conservative jihad. They portrayed his tax plan as dangerously radical, which it was. Some of his nominees as confederacy-loving loons, they actually were. And his voucher plan as a menace to the future of public education, which it very definitely was. To put it bluntly, this is all deranged. You get the impression that the left has actually started believing their own direct mail fundraising letters. That was typical David Brooks writing mm -hmm. in the 2000s and the 1990s, the Weekly Standard. He was he was not the, you know, affable, you know, both sides. It's, you know, we really have to come together in the middle guy. This was how he made his, his bones. In the you mean he wasn't media. all about humility, Drift Class? No. Oh, oh, fuck no. He called us deranged <laughs> and stupid and crazy and on stilts and you're going to have an aneurysm and blah, 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 blah. All of which was wrong. All of which history immediately proved wrong. Uh, but it was during 
and after the run-up to Bush lying this country into the wrong war, that David Brooks really snapped. Uh, because after that happened, out of his pen flowed an endless, gleeful stream of snarling contempt for anyone who questioned the wisdom of George W. Bush or criticized the invasion of Iraq. This is from March 31st, 2003. The phony debate. The pundits are arguing about everything except what's interesting. Meanwhile, on the left, it's like setting in for a long, cold winter. Brace yourself for a round of I told you so's from Iraq hawks, Robert Wright writes in Slate, in the foreseeable future. Al Hunt concedes in the Wall Street Journal that the Bush critics will be very much on the defensive. Now from April 9th, 2003, right around the time David Brooks started referring to the Iraq war in the past tense as something that was over and done with and a complete fucking success. From the rump 15% of Americans who still oppose this war may perhaps grow more bitter, lost in a cul-de-sac of their own alienation. This was followed next week by a cover story called The Fog of Peace, The Evasions, Distractions, and Miasma of the Anti-War Left. This was followed on April 28th of 2003 with a long column called The Collapse of the Dream Palaces, Mass Destruction of Mistaken Ideas. And he goes through a whole long thing, the third of which is, my third guess is that the Bush haters will continue to grow more vociferous as their numbers shrink. Even progress in Iraq will not dampen their anger because as many people have noted, hatred of Bush and his corporate cronies is all that's left of their leftism. And this hatred is tribal, not ideological. And so they will still have their rallies, their alternative weeklies, their Gore Vidal polemics. <laughs> They'll still have a huge influence over the Democratic Party, perhaps even determining its next presidential nominee. But they will seem increasingly unattractive to most moderate and even many normally Democratic voters who never really adopted outrage as their dominant public emotion. Now, My during this goodness. period, I, he was, he, this was, he was on fire. He, he finally got to take off the shackles and join the rest of the conservative media. And just, if you were if you didn't live through it, you will not believe this. You won't believe it, but just shit on, it was a free fire zone. You could attack liberals all you wanted all day long. And there was no rebutting it. Everybody wanted to be on the right side of the big war. And those of us who said, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. That's when we became pariahs. That's that's when the liberal, that's when the blogosphere popped into, into view, mm -hmm. really came of age because nobody was defending us. Nobody was, was taking the, the opposite and true and accurate position. During this time, David Brooks even went so far as to invent an entirely fake avatar for his propaganda named Joey Tabula Rasa. And Joey was an imaginary young person who was just beginning to form opinions about the world. And into Joey's imaginary mouth, David Brooks stuffed all of his favorite cliches about patriotic Republicans and stupid, clueless Democrats. Because reporting facts wasn't enough. He had to invent fictional characters that hated the left. And it was at this moment, as the Bush administration was reaching the peak of its clout, and it looked as if the Democratic Party was down for the count, that David Brooks parlayed his reputation as a staunch Bush supporter and kicker of liberal ass into a job for life as the senior conservative columnist at the New York Times. And at the Times, he continued writing gushing columns supporting the Iraq war and the Bush administration and continued building his national reputation as the leading conservative voice in the mainstream media by landing a regular weekly spot on the PBS NewsHour, a regular weekly spot on National Public Radio, and a few years later becoming something of a pet project for David Gregory, when he was the host of Meet the Press, which was, at the time, the most influential political talk show on television. And as Blue Gal has mentioned, when David Brooks was not available, Gregory would read Brooks's column of that week aloud and ask the panelists what they thought of Brooks's inerrant wisdom. And when Brooks was available, Gregory would read Brooks's column aloud and ask Brooks what he thought of it. <laughs> and that's how David Brooks became ubiquitous. He was everywhere. But a funny thing happened on the way to Karl Rove's permanent Republican majority. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. feel like we could do many, many episodes of this podcast about that. I think we will. I really yes. do think we will. Uh, word started getting out that the Iraq war wasn't over yet. <laughs> yeah. Whoopsie. What? No, I can't be right. I wrote it, it in my column. Win. It's not mission accomplished, really? 
I hit publish. It must be over. <laughs> no, no, it's actually not. Things there were, in fact, not going very well. In fact, we're going very badly and getting worse, much worse. And in exactly the ways that the stupid, feckless liberals had warned them da, it da, was da, going da. to go. Yep. Conservative media lied about it, denied it, attacked anyone who said otherwise. But eventually, denial became impossible, and it started to become clear that Iraq was turning out to be the worst American foreign policy debacle in modern history. And then came Katrina and the Bush administration's fatally incompetent handling of that natural disaster. And even the most staunch anti-government Republican, when you talk about what government should do, believes that international defense wars uh -huh. and natural disasters are two things that the federal government should be doing and well, doing know, well. You know who disagreed with that was Fox News and, and Jeffrey Goldberg. <laughs> yes, uh, right. Who famously said, I believe, to, of the people of, of New Orleans, grow gills. Grow gills. But it was their yeah. fault. Uh, uh, um, Sean Hannity went a long, long tirade about those losers who wouldn't leave, and it's their fault, and let them drown. Mm -hmm. And it was brutal, and it was ugly. And, and it Bush, was race. It was and race. It was race. It was yeah. Pure race. And it was, yeah. it, it was yeah. exposing the Republican Party's bare hatred of black people. Yep. Yep. And then there was Terry Schiavo. Mm -hmm. If you remember Terry Schiavo, this, this poor husband of a woman who was in a permanent vegetative state, and the Republican Party used her and her family and the parents' natural desire to save their daughter mm -hmm. as a political football. Yep. Yep. The, um, the small government Republicans mm -hmm. uh, passed a bill in Congress to protect this one, one woman. person. Yeah. And George Bush, who loved taking his vacations, interrupted his vacation to fly to Washington to sign this horrible bill into law. Mind <laughs> you, Terry Schiavo lived in Florida. So yeah. this was to help his brother Jeb out so that Jeb could stand up on his soapbox and call uh, Democrats murderers and assassins anti -life. and destroyers of yes. anti life. Yeah. This was yeah. all political. And they used this poor woman and her husband as political footballs shamelessly. And then there was the matter of Newt Gingrich's protege, Tom DeLay. Yes. A thoroughly corrupt and loathsome thug, bug man, bug who was man. elected House Majority Leader after the 2002 midterm elections and by 2005 had been indicted by a Travis County grand jury on criminal charges of conspiracy to violate election law by campaign money laundering. Does that sound familiar, Driftlass? Yeah, sure as hell does. And finally, and most hurtfully, David Brooks's favorite Democrat and fellow Iraq War cheerleader, Senator Holy Joe Lieberman, was defeated in his primary by some anti-war guy named Ned Lamont and his pack of liberal Netroots anarchists. And, and David Brooks wrote a whole column about how Tom DeLay Republicans were exactly the same as the net savage Netroots crazies. Uh, <laughs> And that's why we needed a third centrist party. That would, that the would, Joe Lieberman party. The, Joe Lieber, the Lieberman McCain party. <laughs> a party number three, if you will. And he went on and on about how the Netroots crazies were just as bad as, as the delay Republicans. Because even at that moment, uh, you can see what David Brooks was trying to do. Because if you're David Brooks and you're the brand new senior conservative columnist at the most influential newspaper in America... How do you continue to advance the Republican agenda when your Republican Party is falling to pieces right before your eyes? And they're falling apart in exactly the ways that those upstart, foul-mouthed, liberal, netroots kooks had warned you they would. Well, as both Don Draper and Peggy Olson from Mad Men taught us, when you don't like what people are saying, change the conversation. Change it real loud. <laughs> change it real loud and change it everywhere at once. And so this is how, almost overnight, David Brooks, the Weekly Standard's righteous scourge of the stupid, crazy Democrats, became David Brooks, the New York Times' undisputed king of both sides do it. And that's what we mean when we mention the both sides do it razor in the apple. Mm -hmm. Because in virtually every column he has written since the collapse of the Bush administration in 2005, 2006, David Brooks has used exactly the same template 
over and over again to create a column. I even wrote a whole long post once about how to write a David Brooks column because it's very easy. You pick an issue, literally any issue. Then you note the actual destructive or ridiculous or insane Republican position, position on that issue. Then you invent some imaginary liberal position that some imaginary liberal may hold that is opposing the actual Republican position that's crazy or bad. Or you just something, something about an anonymous liberal who might or might not have said something or done something bad that seems silly or ridiculous. Then you decry the folly of the extremes on both sides. <laughs> Even when the moderate, sensible compromise position that Brooks allegedly pines for were exactly the positions Democrats were offering, Brooks would not stop it with the both sides do it bullshit. Instead, to preserve his fairy tale of an America suffering under the lash of the extremes of both sides, David Brooks simply lied over and over again about what actual Democrats were actually proposing. And this is from Jonathan Chait writing about Brooks during the Bush administration or during the Obama administration. Quote, but even if you accept the very strange notion of the political alignment in Trump's Washington, it raises a question Brooks is not prepared to answer. If his objection on the left lies with, quote, Sanders socialism, then isn't there an appealing centrist lying right of that? A moderate who favors market-oriented solutions that bring together business and labor, who welcomes empiricism, who's willing to compromise, a politician who has led the Democratic Party for the last eight years and, in fact, is still sitting as the president of the United States right now. He's referring to Barack Obama. One might think so, but Brooks spent the last eight years defining the center as something Obama was not. It didn't matter that Obama supported a health care plan first devised by Mitt Romney or a cap and trade plan endorsed by John McCain. Brooks nestled himself into the territory between Obama and the angry, no compromise Republicans who were shutting down the government and boycotting all negotiations with the president. If Obama endorsed the policies Brooks preferred, he would simply pretend that Obama hadn't proposed them. Indeed, one of the most common genres of David Brooks' columns was a sad lament that neither party would endorse the policies that, in fact, Obama had explicitly and publicly called for. If Obama offered a deal to raise taxes through tax reform while reducing entitlements, Brooks would write a sad column about how nobody was willing to raise taxes through tax reform and reduce entitlements. If Obama favored education reform, an infrastructure bank, and more high-skilled immigration, Brooks would write a sad column about how nobody favored those things. When Obama supported market-oriented health care reform, Brooks opposed it as an extravagant government takeover. Then, later, he wrote a sad column about how we'd have a very different debate if we knew the law was going to be a discreet government effort to subsidize health care for more poor people, rather than a, quote, extravagant government grab to take over the nation's health care system. Now, that's the end of the Jonathan Chait quote. It's all quite accurate and available online. But we're going to pause here to mention a very important fact you, the listeners, should know about David Brooks, which is when he is confronted by his own hypocrisy, David Brooks does not hesitate to brazenly lie his way out of it. And I know this because in one case, I went to see him in person at the Hammerschmidt Auditorium Lecture on Reinhold Niebuhr back in 2009 or 10. And he got up and gave his little lecture, and there was a question and answer period, and there was a woman who stood up and held up a lot of the quotes that you've heard here today. I think she said, had clippings, right? She, she had actual clippings. A paper yeah. in her hand. Mr. Brooks, you had the chance to be George Bush's Reinhold Niebuhr, to hold him accountable. Now that the Iraq war is a fucking disaster, she didn't say that, but I did. And there's a million dead, and it's, and it's a train wreck all over the, all over the Middle East. What role do you think your columns, relentlessly bashing anyone who opposed the war, played in that? And what is the role of atonement in your theology? She said of David Brooks, who was standing in the pulpit of a church. And David Brooks, without hesitation, said, I don't think I ever wrote anything like that. And then went on to talk about something else entirely. Second case. I was the first person who noticed, I believe in all of media, that David Brooks got a divorce. 
because he stopped wearing his wedding ring when he was on Charlie Rose or Meet the Press or wherever, wherever, and you always wear your wedding ring if you're married. And secondly, he started writing these sad bastard columns about how great marriage was <laughs> and how lonely life is and how life in a hotel sucks. And, and, and the one where he's staring in a, into a ballet class. He's yes, walking looking, down the street and looking in to, at some lovely young ladies, ladies dancing, dancing the ballet. And, just, and, you just and see I'm him. a lonely man in my trench coat. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you know, this is the Creepy. role Walter, Walter Matha would play this role yes. and be in the rain and he'd be sad. Yeah. Um, so I'm clearly he's divorced or getting a divorce while he's writing columns and he has a long history of writing columns, defending marriage, defending marriage at any cost, poor and people, particularly should, for black people, poor, black, poor people should get married, like yeah. it or not. A stable family is more important than whatever you're trying to do. You should get married. You should stay married. I'm a big proponent of staying married and getting married no matter what. Because that will improve your economy. Right. If you stay married, if it all goes back to black people are poor because they're out of wedlock births. This, and that's what leads to poverty in the in the poor communities and the black communities. These unstable Lack of communities. moral values. Right. 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 They're just having kids. They should get married. All the while, he's dumping his first wife. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't say anything about that. And then Charles Lamb, I believe it was on C-SPAN, um, brought it up. Said, you know. I've noticed that you write a lot of in defense of marriage and how divorce is bad. Um, are, aren't you getting a divorce? And that shook him. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. said, I don't think I ever wrote anything about, you know, marriage or divorce, but I can't talk about my situation because of legal reasons. Let's move the fuck on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, David Brooks is a massive hypocrite. Uh, he knows he's lying all the time. He was writing about the glories of Iraq. He had to know things were going wrong. All the time he was writing about marriage, 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 he knew he was divorced or getting a divorce. And yet he wrote and wrote and wrote pious sermons about what other people should do and how other people should behave. Because beneath the spectacles and the soft ties, Dave Rooks is a hardcore ideologue on a very specific mission, which a decade ago I began referring to as his great project. And his great project is to completely rewrite the history of modern American conservatism to cut out of it all mention of the conservative social and political and economic and foreign policy debacles that make Mr. Brooks so very unhappy and repackage the entire era as a fairy tale of noble Whigs being led through treacherous hippie country by the humble David Brooks. Um, you see, Mr. Brooks's relationship with the actual here and now in America has always been a lot like his marriage. A disaster, which Mr. Brooks has been trying to get as far away from as humanly possible because it is the graveyard of all of his ridiculous postulating and pontificating about man and God and culture. And this is why Mr. Brooks has always reserved his biggest, gassiest lies for long sermons on the subject of conservatism's amazing past, which is always just out of sight in the rearview mirror. And conservatism's awesome imaginary future, which is always just over the horizon. This permits him to shrug off whatever atrocities the GOP is actually committing here and now as just glitches or anomalies that will certainly be fixed. And anyway, however much the atrocity du jour may be, however bad it may be, David Brooks and his many imitators are right there to assure millions of God-fearing Americans their viewers and their listeners and their readers, that the extremes on the left are always just as awful and exercise exactly as much real power as the extremes on the right. Now, both siderism has always been a scourge of political journalism. But after the collapse of the Bush administration, both siderism and historical revisionism became codified as the official state religion of the Beltway media because it serves so many useful purposes. It means that political journalists could just memory hole their complicity in selling the Iraq war to the country. Forget about it. Never happened. It's in the past. Shut up. It happened in the past, so it doesn't count anyway. And besides, liberals are pretty bad too. It means that media corporations can attract a much wider audience by hiring Republican lunatics and liars in the name of balance. It provides an all-purpose panic room for any Republican who doesn't want to answer any uncomfortable questions and a panic room for the millions of our fellow citizens who are cowards 
who want to fence straddle every issue, never take a side in any fight, but want to sound smart by saying something clever that they saw on PBS or heard mm-hmm. on NPR. Like mm-hmm. both sides do it. And Blue Gal, you remember um, when Marco Rubio was on Comedy Central? I do. And his answer to John Stewart's very simple questions about basic shit that was falling apart over the and over and over and over again was both times. sides of the aisle both sides both, both sides, sides. Both it's sides. both sides it's both sides. it was it was robotic and it was like a machine gun yep. and because that's what's drilled into these idiots just say the stuff that david brooks has already prepared the ground for people to believe and as both siderism's most dedicated practitioner and its most effective evangelist david brooks has been elevated by his peers to the position of pope of their new state religion. And that has made him one of the most influential players on the respectable right. Mr. Brooks is never to be contradicted. Mr. Brooks is always to be deferred to, which is why an incident on Morning Joe back in 2014 has always stuck with us. We can't find this clip on the internet because it is from many, many moons ago, but we have figured out if you're searching all day long... (laughs) That it was Jeffrey Sachs. And what happened is Jeffrey Sachs on Morning Joe opined that, quote, of course, no one was more wrong about the Iraq war than David Brooks. Out here in the real world, there is nothing controversial about noting that Brooks was very wrong about the Iraq war. That is just a fact of history, something that is simply and indisputably true, which is why the reaction on that show was so memorable. Mika Brzezinski had a shocked and audible gasp. She just went, (gasps) (gasps) then things got very, very quiet. And Jeffrey Sachs clearly realized that he might have crossed a very bad line in terms of being on television. (laughs) He'd taken a very public dump on the media's holiest of holies. So he rushed in a way that was not calm and not matter of fact and not scripted to reassure his host that, of course, David Brooks first of his name, king of the Andals and the first men, lord of the seven kingdoms and protector (laughs) of the realm, was very, very wise and very, very right about so many other things. But on this one small matter of the Iraq war, he was, you know, kind of not right. And then the whole show moved quickly on. And this affront to the laws of God and man was never mentioned again. And I remember watching this at the time and being so surprised that Mika... Her, her mask dropped and she was visibly shocked that anyone would say David Brooks was wrong on television. It, it was, it was, there's a, a moment in Nicholas and Alexandria, which is a movie about the yeah. deposing the czar. When the czar is protected, the czar is protected. Nobody touches, even when he's pr- imprisoned, nobody touches him because he's holy, you know, he's anointed by God. And there was a moment when one of the guards slaps him at the, towards the very end of the movie and everyone just freezes because you've struck the czar. And, and everyone was waiting for a thunderbolt to come down from heaven because you don't, you, that is a death penalty to even look at the czar, much less strike him. And yet nothing happened. And this was that reaction. It's like, oh my God, you've struck David Brooks. You've spoken ill of David Brooks. That is the thing you're never, ever allowed to do because he is an avatar for everything else these assholes hold dear. And that the careers they built are based, jobs. On, are based on his template. Yep. So- yep. We will be doing a deep dive into the second extremely important chapter of Mr. Brooks's career next time on No Fair Remembering Stuff. But until then, I would ask you to meditate on this. The reason David Brooks has such influence over his profession is actually quite similar to the reason Donald Trump has such influence over the Republican Party. So consider that with a job for life at the New York Times and on PBS and on NPR and at the Atlantic Magazine, and a position at the Aspen Institute, and a book publisher willing to press and promote anything he gives them, and a standing invitation to any Network Sunday show he pleases. David Brooks is at the apex of his profession. He's the man. And for decades, he has used his extremely powerful position within his profession to get away with shit that no one in his profession should ever have been allowed to get away with. But no one in his profession says boo about it. No one criticizes him. Instead, they see what he gets away with. They see that there are no consequences to telling the kind of lies he tells. And they imitate him. And they revere him. And they too prosper. And that is how the bow cider is poison has spread until it is 
everywhere. And so there's a direct line between Mika Brzezinski gasping when anyone questions David Brooks yes. to the entire Republican Party bowing down to Donald Trump. Yes. Because he gets away with stuff that they want to get away with. So they imitate him. So they become him. They, they, they ape his behavior. And that's why everyone on the right and in the center who wants to pretend they want to be in the center or who wants a job as a pundit on television, learn to say the magic words. Both sides do Both it. Both sides, sides do, do it. it. Yep. Um, that 2006 election, Matthew Dowd made an entire career out of saying both sides do it. It's the corrupt duopoly. Uh, 2016. 2016 election. Yeah. And then yeah. when that all blew up in his face, he did the thing that pundits do, which is he just wiped the past away. He, and his delete friend, my Nicole entire Wallace, Twitter thread. And delete just delete his off. entire Twitter thread. Block anyone who says otherwise. Go on MSNBC where his friend Nicole Wallace will wipe away his past. And it just never happened. And that is how the media works. And that is why things are so deeply screwed up. Because nobody dares to remember the past except your friends here at no Fair Remembering Stuff. No Fair Remembering Stuff. Thanks so much for listening to the second very long practice episode. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a lot of very positive feedback and some suggestions about tweaks to the format. So keep your comments coming. Our plan is to do a couple more of these and including a David Brooks Part 2 uh, before the end of the year. And then if we have enough Patreon donors to do these every week on Tuesdays, in addition to our regular Thursday show, don't forget we're about halfway to getting 300 patrons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash pro left pod. And thank you for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional Left Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions. <laughs> <laughs>